Hey everybody, and welcome back to Wondrium Now, where we give you an inside look at some of the series currently streaming on Wondrium. I'm Rich Burnett, and in today's show, we'll be discussing the promises and perils of technology. Click to prove that you're not a robot, and let's get started. Today's first guest is Crystal Dilworth. Crystal's work includes advancing the role of women in STEM, hosting CBS's Dr. Brain, and interviewing Nobel laureates about their process of discovery. Most importantly for us here at Wondrium, Crystal is the host of our upcoming show called The Promises and Perils of Technology. Let's take a peek. So much of the technology that we are using these days exploits us, right? It, it, it kind of takes our data and harvests us. Of course, you know, we've kind of known for some time now that we are the product, yeah, right? If it's free. If it's free, you're the product. <laughs> and so as a result of that, it's very difficult actually to, you know, delimitate from all of those technologies, which you need in your daily life. You need it in your, you need it in your work. You need it in your schooling. You need it in everything that you do. And, um... I think that there's a lot of things that an uh, individual can do. Some of it is actually turning it off because I do not I think that a lot of the a lot of the issues can be avoided by actually just turning the switch off. Crystal, hello. Thanks for joining us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. So first off, tell us a little bit about this new series, this promises and perils of technology. I mean, the new series is kind of amazing. It's a series of sit-down interviews, sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations with experts in different fields. In this case, they've all sort of touched both technology and scientific advancement and sort of the interface between what we can do and what we should do, you know, in terms of societal impact. And so you really get a chance to see, you know, many individual takes on something that is actually quite a big factor in, in our daily lives. How many uh, experts do you talk to in the series? There's five interviews, five experts, five different takes, you know, everything from someone who has been a content creator and is now an expert in the neurotech space to someone that has actually looked down at us from space. So you really get a huge breadth of um, different opinions and different takes in it. You know, for me, it was really great to have that survey kind of helped change the way that I was thinking about some of the decisions I was making around my own technology. Like you said, the show has you talking with some of the country's experts, um, leading experts, I should say, on topics like uh, diversity in tech, biohacking, how video games affect our world. Uh, but what were some of the takeaways that surprised you that, that you didn't expect? I think I was hoping for a better answer to some of the challenges um, that we experience at the interface, like in terms of privacy and in terms of behavioral control um, by well-programmed technologies. It seemed like the answer was kind of self-regulation, like put your phone down and go outside. You know, um, how do you break this toxic cycle? Like, yes, you can try and program things to be, you know, healthier for humans, but that's sort of like antithetical to our like capitalist societal needs. So we really have the responsibility as individuals to consider how we're using our technology, to consider the permissions that we're allowing and to make our own decisions. That was surprising to me. But what we also heard is that there's not a lot of systemic incentive. There's an awareness. People are studying it. We have a much better understanding of how the technology that we create has been created to um, harness some of the weakest aspects of, you know, human neuroscience and behavior. But I, I think what was lacking in all of the conversations was like systemic support for these more human um, directions for evolution mm -hmm. of technology. I mean, speaking with Natoki Ford about, you know, diversity and equity in the tech space, it was also the same. There's a lot of really good people working on it. There's an acknowledgement that this is a problem, you know, um, but we lack the systemic incentive to move meaningfully in that direction. And so this is perhaps a call to action, these conversations around that. Living in a capitalist society where these companies have the bottom line in mind, and maybe that's not the direction we need to go as uh, you know, a human race, what are some of those incentives 
that might be government regulated? Are there any in the works? Well, we haven't really found a great way to monetize human happiness and well-being, but we're trying. Um, but even even if you just think about like the natural system of like evolution and how human behavior evolved, I always like to say that brains evolved to keep us alive, not make us happy. And so we're even fighting some of our own natural hardware to find fulfillment, to find happiness, you know, to to find meaning um, with a hardware system, the technology that's up here that's designed to keep us alive and give us short-term uh, positive feedback. So that's an interesting point about our brains evolving uh, to keep us alive as opposed to keep us happy. But it feels like a lot of our distractions as people, uh, especially on our cell phones and, and other forms of technology, is there to keep us happy. Um, how might that be affecting our brains or are we trying to use this technology as a substitute for what our brains do not do? I don't necessarily know that they're designed to keep us happy. They're designed to keep us content. So I think the apps are actually hacking the survival circuit as opposed to maximizing the happiness patterns, if that makes sense. But we did talk with Taryn Southern, who's currently working in the neurotech space, about ways that tech might be able to actually physically interact with some of those circuits in the brain, whether it's like brain machine interfaces or other actual um, technical synergy between technology, like digital technology and, you know, the biological organism that could perhaps lead to some expansion of, you know, what I would call happiness behaviors. But of course, that always leads to the question, who's writing those programs? So in talking to all these experts for the show, did you come away with any big, like, so what moments? I mean, I think there's a general consensus around collaboration that the, that the feeling of us versus them, whether it's like humans versus technology, um, or this group of technologists versus that group of technologists is really unhelpful. Um, obviously, you know, astronaut Elon Melvin had like the best way of describing this because he really has sort of left Earth and has had the experience of looking down from outer space and seeing everyone on this, you know, beautiful planet and thinking there has to be a way that we can all work together around common goals. And, you know, his own individual experience working with people on the International Space Station from countries that, you know, maybe the United States didn't exactly have a great political relationship with on Earth, but they were relying on each other for survival and they worked together as a team um, and they trusted and respected each other. And so that was kind of like a little microcosm of like how it could work and that it is possible. What are the key takeaways that you hope uh, our viewers will get after watching this series? humans are responsible for their technology. You know, they say the robot overlords, the robots are going to make a decision for us. No, somebody coded that piece of technology. Somebody made the decision. You know, I've heard, I mean, a good friend of mine says this. I'm not really sure where the quote originated, but like every line of code is a vote for an imagined future. And that's really true. You know, that's why there's such a need for diversity in the people that are building these technologies, because otherwise, you know, you end up with digital cameras that only track white faces. Um, so we are responsible both for how we use the technology and how we build the technology. And once we understand that, I think we can move to a healthier relationship with it. Okay, Crystal, so as we like to do, we uh, gather questions from our audiences on social media. So I have a few here for you. Um, let's start with Debbie M. from Facebook. Debbie asks, what's the scariest threat that concerns you about technological advancements, uh, specifically AI, killer robots? I'm less worried about the killer robots. I'm more worried about loss of personal agency. Um, I don't like the fact that we can build technologies that manipulate who we are and how we are <laughs> using our own knowledge of neuroscience and behavior. Um, 
I had this experience once where I was, um, was doing a story on humanoid robots and I was interacting with a robot in a specific scenario. Um, I think they were a travel agent. I was, you know, like pretending to buy a ticket to London and they were telling me the prices and all of this stuff. And it was having an interaction as if you would have it with a human travel agent. And when I looked at the tape back, I saw in myself, I was doing certain things like mirroring the robot's behavior. So the robot would like breathe, my breathing started to sync with theirs and they would they would shift in their seat one direction or another and I would shift to mirror them. And that's a human behavior that we do called mirroring. And it's designed to build empathy and understanding um, with another human. I was trying to do that with a robot. Um, and I think that there's something there that's quite scary because they cannot build empathy with us, but we certainly can have a oxytocin, empathy, emotional bond with them. Um, and I think that's something that can be exploited and I need to think more about. So Debbie M, again, she also asks, will humans ever reach their full potential with help of technology? When can I become a cyborg? I mean, we're doing some pretty cool stuff now with uh, human computer interactions and interfaces. I mean, there are studies ongoing that require human patients to have implants in their brain um, that either like help them communicate better with a computer or in the case of deep brain stimulation and Parkinson's patients can actively tune how they are behaving in the world you know, by injecting electrical current into their brains. It helps to reduce tremor. It helps to reduce other symptoms. So I don't think you necessarily have to wait to be a cyborg, um, but unfortunately, maybe you will need to be a disease patient at this point first. So I need to call my wife and, and let her know that my mother-in-law is a cyborg. All right, that's a great takeaway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Len R. on Twitter asks, will AI ever become sentient? What is sentient in this? If you're asking me, that's an answer that I do not have prepared. But like, no, I mean, I think that this is more a philosophical question than anything. Sure. Like we've talked about like what is consciousness and like what levels of consciousness and sentience can mm -hmm. animals, for instance, attain? Can computers attain but will we ever have that same ability? Will, will computers ever have that same ability to imagine a completely random new future and new way of being and then work together, share that idea amongst themselves and, and, and create it, you know, will it into being, which is something that right now is specially reserved, we think, for the human race. Right. Probably in the future, but I don't think it's going to look the same as what we are now considering to be, you know, the high level of consciousness that humans attain. So are algorithms considered AI? I mean, I think that they are. You have to build, you build algorithms, you know, to drive your artificial intelligence, to drive your machine learning. It explores, it learns from the feedback that it gets and it makes changes to its operational model based on that feedback, just like babies do. <laughs> you know, that's like how kids learn, right? We're already at that point where computers can do that. Um, we, we're already at the point where computers can sense themselves. They have to, you know, when you look at like Boston Dynamics, like all those really cool robots that are like, one, they look like dogs, they're doing backflips and do they have to sense themselves and their environment. And the system needs that sort of feedback in order to be successful at performing the one thing that they were designed to do. Um, so once all of these capabilities are put together, I think you'll have something that closely resembles like a sentient being, mm -hmm. but whether or not that sentience will have the same level of consciousness that we attribute to ourselves, I think is more of a philosophical question and we need to better understand the layers of consciousness before we can talk about what can be attained by robots. So the last question here is from Vicky on Instagram. And Vicky asks, what is the future of pharmaceutical technology in terms of brain chemistry and physiology? Um, I would hope that it would be a better understanding 
of the chemical systems that control behavioral outputs so that we can stop doing a, hey, this chemical works and we're not sure why, but let's prescribe it anyway. Um, most of pharmaceutical interventions into brain chemistry, we know something about the mechanism, but only because it worked first. And then because it worked, we went back to investigate why. I would really love to be able to work with, and now we're talking about applications of AI. I would love for us to be able to work with molecular dynamic models, use quantum computing to accurately predict the way that drugs are going to interact with certain receptors, and do some machine learning on what the best molecule to bind the receptors in, in the right way are so that we can actually design drugs for particular outputs instead of working our way backwards from the mechanism. And that's just from me as a molecular, you'll get different answers from different people, but as a molecular neuroscientist, the ability to link those things together would be absolutely transformational. Crystal, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, where can people find out more about you and the work that you're doing? I'm mostly on Instagram at polycrystalhd. That's where I put most of my new stuff. I'm on Twitter a little bit, um, and I avoid Facebook like the play. So come find me on Instagram. You'll learn all the stuff that I'm up to, um, and it's usually pretty cool. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'd like to take a quick moment to remind you that guests on our show are experts from our family here at Wondrium. In addition to series about technology, you'll also find topics like science, history, mental health, and even foreign language instruction. There's something for everyone on Wondrium. And now, with the recent addition of hundreds of documentaries and how-to series, there's never been a better time to join. If you want to binge watch something, watch something that's smart. By experts on biodiversity. Mayan history. Physics. Art. Streaming is a lot smarter with Wondrium. Wondrium, because I wonder. Knowledge is now streaming at Wondrium. Our next guest is Jen Goldbeck. Jen is the author of Analyzing the Social Web, and she's a frequent contributor on NPR. Her many TED Talks cover different areas of human interaction online, and she was even featured in TED's Year in Ideas recap in 2014. But we know Jen best from her series called Taking Control of Your Personal Data. Let's take a peek. You're probably familiar with artificial intelligence algorithms that use your data, even if you haven't thought about it. For example, Netflix and Amazon both make recommendations to users. Netflix suggests shows we might want to watch. Amazon recommends products we might want to buy. They do this with artificial intelligence algorithms that analyze what we've interacted with before and then guess about new things we might like in the future. But what's going on inside those algorithms and what else can they find out about us? Hi, Jen. Welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. So today we're discussing the promises and perils of technology. So you are a perfect guest to have on. Uh, your previous series uh, called Taking Control of Your Personal Data touches on one of the most concerning areas of technology, which is protecting our online identity. Um, so a question for you to start us off here. What are some of the less than obvious ways that we are vulnerable while online? One of the things that we get told a lot is to be careful about the things that we post online, uh, which you should be careful about. But the fact is that you're being tracked and monitored in all kinds of other ways through your phone, through your browser, through apps that you use. And so your personal actions are really a small part of all the ways that data is being collected about you in the background. A question that arises is sort of the top level question here is what are the reasons for collecting this sort of data? Let's say it's not, you know, some scammer collecting our data, but a corporation doing it, quote unquote, legally, you know, what are they using our info for? So I would say the biggest thing is targeted advertising, which we all kind of know about. But we've seen a lot of other things come out in the news after the last, say, three or four years. Um, if we want to go back a little before that, Cambridge Analytica is a great example. This was a scandal in the 2016 elections where a company collected data on millions of Americans and used it to create what I guess you could call a targeted ad, but what's really 
psychologically focused messages about the election in that case. And in this case, they were trying to get President Trump elected, uh, but they wouldn't come to say a Democrat and expect to get them to vote for Trump. But what they would do is use that data that they had, come up with some deep insights about your personality and the things that you cared about, and then try to use that to get you to just not vote, which then essentially takes away a vote for, in that election, Hillary Clinton. Uh, we've seen other examples where apps are kind of listening in in the background. This is something I talk about a lot in the course. And in addition to using that for advertising, we saw an example in Spain where uh, an app was actually used to listen in to see what TVs were on if people were in a bar and then check a database to see if the bar had paid the licensing fee to show a soccer game. And if they hadn't paid the fee, then the soccer league would basically come after them and find them. In America, companies are always saying, we are not listening to you through your, your smart devices. Is, what are the chances that that is a lie? 100% that's a lie. Uh, they absolutely are. Uh, now, how much they're doing it, we don't know. But Facebook, for example, um, has patents that they've published about being able to listen in on the TV in the background to see what commercials you're listening to, what shows you're watching. Uh, but absolutely, we know that there's lots of apps out there that passively turn on the microphone. They listen in in the background and they will pay attention to, like I said, radio, TV. The, there's plenty of technology out there that will listen for beacons in stores, these little sounds that we humans can't hear, but that actually allow our position to be triangulated within a building um, that can track how we move through that building. It could ideally be used, say, if you're in a store to show you an ad literally for the product that you're standing in front of, maybe offer you a discount on it. Um, all this kind of tech is very well documented, available. You can install it in an app. So 100% yes, your phone is listening to you. We just don't have a really full catalog of all the ways that's happening at this point. That is horrifying. Um, <laughs> is this an instance of technology being too far advanced that laws and regulations just haven't been written in order to curb this type of behavior? Because it seems very illegal. It's a, it should totally seem illegal, right? Uh, like if you want to wiretap somebody's house, you have to go through a really big legal process to do that. You see it all over the place. They say uh, privacy inhibits innovation. Regular uh, regulation inhibits innovation. We just got to keep building new stuff. And there's no way we could do that if there were regulation and privacy rules, which is utter nonsense. Uh, there are smart people building that technology. Mm -hmm. They could do it with good regulation and ethical respect for people's privacy, um, but they don't want to. And they've been really successful in quashing a lot of legislation that the vast majority of Americans want to see. So we really need a big push for better privacy and security laws in this country. And they're woefully far behind the tech at this point. What are the types of ways you might be able to protect yourself that aren't the obvious, you know, two-step factor authentication? One that I have started using as an example is that um, some of my newer credit cards have an option to generate a virtual credit card number to use online, and you can generate a bunch of these. So if you are buying stuff from places and you know, perfectly reputable companies have breaches where your credit card number gets stolen. Um, you can generate those virtual credit card numbers. So if somebody does steal it, it's like a one-time use kind of thing. Also paying through something like PayPal, who has your credit card, um, that's like one person that has your credit card, right? PayPal has it. And then if you pay through PayPal, all those merchants that you're paying don't get the credit card. They just have a direct PayPal transaction. Mm -hmm. So that keeps your number private. And that's true for any of these, uh, you know, Venmo, any of these places that you can pay online. So thinking about reducing how much your valuable credit profile, social security number, those sorts of details get out there and how much you can manipulate them. That's a really good way to protect yourself from these hackers because they generally want to get money from you. Our laws are really far behind there too on the cybersecurity side because there's always going to be these bad actors trying to steal money from you in whatever way they can. Uh, but that is in the works. And for people who are interested in, in both the privacy and security side, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they're at EFF.org, they have a really great 
constantly updated database of legislation that's in the works, both at the state and federal level on all these kinds of issues. So it's a really good place to check in and, and see what's being pushed for and maybe write your representatives to get them to get some better rules in place. So as an expert in the field of social data analytics, a uh, question comes up, what is your general outlook on the future impact of the internet on people's personal data? It depends on the day you ask me. Sometimes it's very dystopian, <laughs> and I just feel like we have ruined everything. Uh, you know, I helped build some of this technology, and there's it does some really good things. But man, is it like out of control in the way that that we're just being mined uh, for data and it's being used to kind of control us. There's a, there's a really dystopian way that things could go. Uh, but there's really good things that come from this too. And to get it not to this dystopian place, we just need the right rules in place. So I can say, no, like you can't follow me around. You can't track this. You can't listen in. You can't sell my data to people. You can't manipulate me and personalize what I see like that. I don't want that. I just want to talk to my friends, find this community, you know, listen to some new music. And with the right rules, we can achieve that. So on days I'm feeling positive, I go, you know what, those rules are going to come in the next few years, one way or another. And we're gonna get to a place where we can take advantage of all the great stuff that comes from this uh, without you know, being treated as a, a mind to just have things extracted from us. That, that's where I hope we end up. So yeah, there's a, a, a popular quote that if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. Um, but a, another question for you is from the perspective of companies who benefit from doing this sort of data mining, what would they say to folks who have that outlook of this is a dystopian future we're heading towards? Like what, what benefits are they saying that this data mining is providing society? Uh, it, it's pretty dystopian <laughs> itself when you try <laughs> to get them to talk about it. So they have to find a way <laughs> to justify it. Um, and they say, well, you get more personalized things. We help you find what you want. You're going to see the best, most exciting stuff. Even though lots of people say, like, just show me my Facebook feed in chronological order. I just want to see what my friends yeah. post. Uh, <laughs> you know, they make up reasons. Uh, and, and like I said, there's good things that come from sort of this personalization, from having a good understanding of what we like. Um, but that's not really how we've seen it play out. You know, the bottom line is, big tech companies make money from extracting our data and from developing these kind of deep insights about us and they want to keep doing it so they can come up with all sorts of excuses but um you know they're getting the money out of it and we're not so jen before we uh end here were there any other interesting technologies that maybe aren't so publicly known that corporations are using to to track us yeah yeah i think an important thing when I talk about all the stuff that we've mentioned in this conversation, I sometimes get pushed back from people that it's like, well, I can turn off my microphone or my location settings. And the fact is it's pretty easy to get around that in a lot of ways. So just one example, um, your phone has an accelerometer. That's the thing that can kind of tell which direction it's tilting. And that accelerometer is sensitive up enough to pick up the vibrations created by you talking. Um, so there's actually research that shows you can convert the vibrations that the accelerometer picks up into speech. It essentially becomes a microphone. So even if you were to rip the microphone out of your phone and it wasn't a phone anymore, if they wanted to listen in, there's technology that lets that happen. Um, and it's not just on your phone. So if you have a Roomba, it, ha it uses a technology called LiDAR, which lets it look ahead and see furniture and walls and stuff. The LiDAR is sensitive enough to pick up the vibrations that your voice causes in your furniture. And researchers at the University of Maryland, where I work, have shown that if I hacked your Roomba, I could send that LiDAR data up to a server, which could process it and also find a speech from that. So the idea that you adjust a couple settings on your phone and thus you're immune from this, like it's just wrong. There's lots of ways to get around those privacy settings. And if there's money to be made, we see that tech companies do that all the time. We are truly living in a science fiction future. <laughs> Jen, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Uh, Twitter is a great place. I'm Jen Goldbeck on Twitter, and I share all sorts of resources about this stuff, and you can reach out to me there too. 
Great, and the irony isn't lost on us that we're talking about following you online. But uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. I'll talk soon. Thanks. And that'll do it for another episode of Wondrium Now. To learn who our upcoming guests are and to ask them questions, make sure to keep an eye on our social media feeds. You can find links to all of them in the description below. We'll be back soon with another great show. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.